All right, uh, rotation. Um, this is really the holistic farm approach. Uh, over the years, I've worked with various pieces, uh, no-till, subsoiling, things like that. Uh, but when you look at a farm as a system, that's where rotations really come into play. And rotations are one of the things that's like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but not everybody does it. Uh, they think they are, but aren't really. Uh, so we're gonna start with rotations, uh, why rotations, and then some tools of rotations. And then at the end, I'll take those tools and put it together in a package. In a 44 year experiment, they found crop rotations consistently out yielded continuous cropping. And the advantages were enhanced when they used no-till. And that's pretty much what I found over my 40 years, 50 years of uh, working in agriculture. Uh, when we had a diversified rotation, we had greater soil organic carbon, uh, a greater active carbon, uh, and greater plant uh, potentially mineralizable uh, nitrogen. The other piece comes back to what we were talking before with the uh, the subsoil, the soil compaction, is aggregate stability was significantly greater on diver diversified rotations relative to a two crop or a monoculture uh, type system. So the factors that affect your rotation are your soils, uh, your slopes or erosion hazards, uh, the crop choice, is it annual or perennial, uh, how much legumes are supplying uh, nitrogen, and then uh, is there long-term grass in there uh, that you would need to uh, put nitrogen or manure on? But the bottom line is, is what is your products that you are producing for market? When we look at this on a holistic picture, uh, the yield curve for continuous cropping is the, the yields go down as time goes on if you grow the same crop over and over again. That's a long-term rotation. It ends up with a low average yield. If we go to a short rotation, you have a lot higher average yield because you're hitting the peak parts of those crops. So let's take a step aside and look at some of the tools of rotation. And these are things that we have developed or have worked with over the years, uh, over the uh, 30 to 40 years uh, on farms, what is working to make things really happen. Probably the number one tool that we have come up with, uh, and I started this 20 years ago, was winter forages. Winter forages are cover crops on rotations. Uh, both my soil surface compaction talk this morning, uh, and then uh, Kirsten's work uh, with uh, cover cropping systems are all using uh, cover crops. In this case, we are using a cover crop uh, that, it, you know, a cover crop costs money, but it uh, takes money to take it back out again. It will give you a long-term re re, uh, results. But winter forages not only makes you money that year, uh, but they're also getting all the benefits from cover cropping uh, over that time frame. You're keeping the soil cover, you're keeping the uh, soil on the field. And what Rodale found was that it builds structure all year round with those living root exudates. And I have taken that to the point now, I don't wanna see any bare soil uh, over the winter. We wanna keep something growing all the time. It's gonna sequester nutrients and living organic matter, which keeps it from leaving the field, uh, protecting the surface, you're keeping uh, particulate phosphorus from leaving. By having living roots, you're keeping dissolved phosphorus from leaving and nitrogen from leaving, uh, it's staying in the plants. And then it also allows us to maximize no-till. It saves on time, fuel, uh, soil, long-term benefits. And we never leave a window for weeds to get started. So that's why we have been big proponents of using winter forage as part of your normal rotation system. Looking at it uh, as a forage, uh, it is one of the best forages we can produce uh, with proper nitrogen and sulfur where one run 20% crude protein. And the digestibility is better than brown midrib, either corn or sorghum. 
It's a very high digestible forage. Now, when we got into doing this, uh, we learned early on, if we wanna maximize the yield, we had to change how we were growing it. Originally, we were growing it like we were growing wheat uh, or a grain crop, winter grain crop. We found we needed to do the exact opposite. It needs to go into the ground two weeks before our wheat planting date. Well, to do that, we're gonna have to shorten up the corn. If our corn was given us 20 tons, uh, based on Bill Cox's work, and we go from 105 day to an 85 day, we now reduce that uh, three tons of silage, but we turn around and at bare minimum, we are getting five to six tons of triticale coming off of that same field. So our total yield is higher. Uh, what we actually have been doing by planting it that two weeks earlier and getting that real massive growth going into the fall and winter, we were getting 10 tons of silage off of the winter cover crop. Uh, the winter forage. And when you put that with the uh, corn yield we had, we were way far ahead of a single corn crop with bare soil over the winter. And then what we have found because our soil health is so improved, our soil structure is so improved, the soil surface is protected, very aer aerated. Um, we are now getting back equal or more corn than what we started. So our 20 tons that we were getting originally, we're getting that and another 10 tons of winter forage uh, as our cover. I really like how it leaves the soil surface. Uh, this is a cover that is really thick in terms of stems, but there isn't a lot of horizontal residue there to have slugs develop underneath it and slugs become a problem. When there's a pounding rain, this material breaks up that raindrop impact. And because each of the stems have a dying root underneath it, channels the water into the soil. Uh, so we get more water. Uh, it's adding organic matter the whole time, but keeping the soil open. So we have air moving in and out uh, and the soil stays on the field. Uh, our corn, uh, we simply come in with a clearing culture or a strip till. Uh, work a narrow zone, uh, plant the corn, that gets past the allelopathic effect from the winter forages, because all winter forages, wheat, rye, triticale, barley, et cetera, have allelopathy to the next crop. Uh, strip till gets around that problem uh, while still protecting the soil. We just simply lose, use a floating clearing culture to scrape away a half inch of soil. It improves the structure of the next crop. So the corn grain increases, the soybean yield significantly increases. Nitrate in drainage water is reduced. We are tying that up as nitrogen and protein in the forage that we were harvesting. So we're taking a money loss and turning it into a money maker. But the biggest piece is, is comes back to the morning talks, surface permeability in a clay soil increases sevenfold because we are letting all those uh, uh, root uh, and uh, stem pieces allow air in and out. Now, an offshoot of this, and we discovered this quite by accident, uh, we were looking at the allelopathic effect and we found out allelopathy does not uh, affect legumes. So we came back in and we no-tilled our seedings into it. This is a very different process than what has been done before. We are putting the seeding in in June, the first week in June in New York. Uh, it's after corn planting is done. It's after your haylage is all harvested. We've harvested the triticale early. We come back into that stubble in early June, hit it with a low rate of Roundup or in a high gallonage of water, or you can do it without if you're no organic. And then we come in and no-till our seeding right into that residue. And it made a huge, huge difference in A, the success of the seeding, B, the erosion control, and C, shifting your workload so you can get things done. If we look in the springtime, we got the first nice day, we're a week behind. The second nice day, we're two weeks behind. Uh, you're trying to get manure spread. Uh, and while you're doing that, uh, you are uh, uh, 
trying to get ground worked up for seedings because you're supposed to put them in early. Uh, and you're trying to do the seedings, pick the stones and get everything done while you're trying to spread manure and till for corn. And because you're doing all those seedings, you're not incorporating the manure immediately. And if you're not incorporating the manure immediately, you're losing three quarters of the nitrogen that's in it. And we can't afford to do that anymore. So then we come in, we plant our corn, we get our haylage done. So what we have done with the new process is to take this and move it to here. So in the spring, we spread our manure immediately incorporated to capture the nitrogen for the corn crop uh, that's coming along. We plant our corn, we get our haylage done and our winter forage. Winter forage is harvested just before haylage. So uh, we start harvesting winter forage, continue right on through. When we're done with haylage, we come back in and no-till seed into the triticale stubble. When we're doing a new seeding, this is what the fields look like. Oh, it looks pretty good. They got it nice and smooth. Uh, the seeds are up uh, real close to the surface. It looks perfect until it rains. And then we have a god awful mess. You got fields that are washing away, stones, erosion. They wash the seedlings right out. <coughs> so by having a residue on that field, first of all, reduces seedling risk. We're planting in the first week in June or the last week in May. We are not doing it in early April. So the soils are warm, the soils are drier, the plants germinate and get out of the ground quickly. So they're less susceptible to phytophthora and damping off and all the other diseases that thin out our seedings. It increases the seeding year yield. Normally you're getting uh, half a crop the first year. So if it's a four ton crop, you might get two tons of hay crop off uh, the seeding year. Where this picture was taken, we have already harvested three to three and a half tons of dry matter as winter forage. This was triticale as winter forage at flag leaf stage. And then we're going to come back and get another ton or so of alfalfa or clover or whatever uh, in the middle of the summer. It stops erosion. I had a farm uh, in central New York. They had a 60 acre field. Uh, they worked it all up. They put in tile line. Uh, they smoothed it all up. They lined it. They picked all the stones. They put in a seeding in early April. They put a lot of work into that field. Across the road, they had a triticale field. They mowed that off at the right time, came back and no-tilled uh, their seeding into it. Uh, at the end of June, uh, they had several inches of partly cloudy in about 15 minutes. It just dumped. And he said the field they had put all the work into was a complete mess. There was gullies, there was stones all over, the seedings had washed out, and right across the road was 50 acres of the nicest alfalfa in triticale stubble with zero soil loss, zero erosion. They have moved all of their seedings to be going in after a winter forage cover. The allelopathy will inhibit weeds, but more importantly, it balances the workload out on the farm. You know, as consultants, we come in and tell the farmers they got to do this, 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 and this. And their answer is, okay, that we can do that if you get your butt out here and get on the tractor and do some of the work for me, because there aren't enough hours in the day. But this moves that workload from April to early June, so then you can do it. And if you can do it and it works like it does with the alpha, this alfalfa in the picture, and that's what farmers have found, because they could do it so easy and it has a high degree of success, they are no longer afraid of rotating. They, a lot of times they don't wanna rotate the crop because putting in the seeding is such a risk. Now it is no longer a risk. Now let's move on to another tool of rotation. This is one that has come up uh, in the past uh, five to eight years and is really taking a hold on farms. And that is shallow manure injection. Saves money, saves fertilizer, uh, keeps the fertilizer on the field. We have 8,000 gallons of manure surface spread. That's 42 pounds of organic nitrogen available. Uh, if we incorporate it, we gain another 120 pounds or 162 pounds of nitrogen. 
simply because we stuck it in the ground immediately. That is a lot of money. $120 an acre is what you are saving. If you're doing a winter forage and then coming back with corn or sorghum afterwards, you inject the manure for the winter forage, you inject the manure for the corn or sorghum, and you end up saving $240 an acre. And that fertilizer is in the ground. It's not washing away. It's not going into the streams. It's making money for you. Uh, this is what this is just one of the machines that we have gone with. Uh, Zim makes another one, and there's a third company. That's a simple rolling coulter with an injector. Here we are injecting into 10 inch tall um, uh, winter triticale the last Monday before Thanksgiving. We injected uh, 8,000 gallons in and it carried over, uh, supplied all the fertilizer for the crop uh, the next year. So it's a way that you can apply your manure. Again, we're putting this manure at an off cycle time, uh, November, there's very little extra field work to do on the farms. So then we can unload the manure storage to this winter forage crop. Uh, this is the other unit right here. This is another kind. Uh, it's a rolling coulter and they inject the manure behind it, lifts it up, opens it and drops it in. Uh, where we did this, this was triticale with uh, planted on time uh, with no manure. Uh, where we added the manure before planting, uh, we got higher crude protein, but the same amount of manure injected in November gave us 18% almost crude protein at the start. And when we're up at 60 pounds, if we had 60 pounds of nitrogen, we would have had 20% we were targeting. And all we had to do was change the amount of manure we were adding and it would have met all the fertilizer needs. Now, Paul Saracoletti over in the, uh, the, the watershed, they use the same principle. They looked at our, our triticale and said, our grass hay fields look the same. So we're gonna come in and do that. So they came in with the injectors uh, and injected uh, into intensive grass. Uh, they were putting 5,000 gallons down, which is 26 pounds of organic matter and 75 uh, pounds of ammonia that is not going anywhere. That's $100 an acre savings on fertilizer. Uh, what they found is that they run the cultures at a four degree instead of a six degree, and at less than three miles an hour, it minimizes the stone lift. I prefer a unit that's on a 15 inch spacing. We did originally on an 18 inch spacing. It was fine, the manure spread itself out underground. I prefer 15 because then I can lift up every other rig and come back in and put it right into corn and meet our corn needs by uh, injecting the manure. Another tool that we have used is one that I developed back in the early 1980s. Uh, I got into a big argument with a former professor at the college. Uh, he insisted that you had to plow uh, sod fields the first year of no-till. And I told him he was crazy. And so what we found was if we come in and we kill that sod in the fall, it works like a charm. Between the 1st and the 15th of October, we come in with a quarter Roundup and a quarter 2,4-D um, and uh, hit it, walk away from the field the next spring. This is the earliest corn you can plant. And all you have to do is hook up the planter and drive through the field. It's the consistency of potting soil. It has residue to keep it from washing away. The roots are decaying. And so it's a very porous surface soil that is protected. But probably the biggest thing that we have uh, is that you're just planting it. You don't have to do any tillage. Uh, these are old pictures because we did the work in 1980. That's before they had uh, all the fancy cameras and stuff we have today. Uh, the guy in the picture has grandkids now. He was about 20. 829 at the time of the picture. But if you look at it, the upper left picture here, this is spring killed, this is fall killed. Uh, if it was a color picture, this is a blue green, this is a yellow green. Down here, we planted across the picture, this is fall killed, this is spring killed. It was easily a foot or more higher. And more importantly, when they did uh, careful yield checks on it, 
found we had 17% more yield by fall killing than by spring killing. Now remember, spring killing is already giving us 15% higher yield than corn following corn. And then we add 17% on top of it, it makes it a no brainer. It's one of the easiest things you can do on a farm is to simply come in, fall kill it and plant your corn in the spring. Now, another tool of rotation is the other energy crop, sorghum. And there is a lot of work coming down the pike on this. This is gonna change radically because we've had some major breakthroughs on research that I am doing on the energy of sorghum. Uh, this field uh, was on a farm that the farmer had it free. The guy that owned it let him work the ground. It was the most expensive ground he had because he only got one crop in five years. The owner was a deer hunter. He wanted lots of deer there and the lots of deer were eating up everything he was growing. We put sorghum out there and the deer hide in it and come out and eat the neighbor's corn but he was pulling 23 tons of the acre off of a field. He had gotten nothing off the previous year. Sorghum is planted after the winter forage and haylage, so your workload is balanced out a little bit more. It improves the soil structure. It has a very fine root system. It's a grass, but it's more like a perennial grass root system. So it improves the soil structure. It costs $20 an acre to plant instead of 130 that corn costs today. Uh, you're saving over $100 an acre by using this. It wipes out corn rootworm. So the people that are growing corn after corn after corn after corn, uh, by putting in one year of sorghum, you can go two more years after that with no rootworm control because the prussic acid in the sorghum kills the rootworm larva, and then you, they don't lay eggs in that field anyway, so you don't have any rootworms. It's drought tolerant. It'll yield twice as much as corn will on an inch of water. No processing is needed, so that just reduced our cost, and it has a wide harvest window. The changes that we have made in this, we no longer plant it in corn row with. Uh, this is like a month and a half after planting. Uh, the corn row widths, you can see the sun is hitting the ground. That means when there's a pouring rain, it's going to impact on the soil, seal the soil over, uh, and let weeds grow. The narrow row width sh shades the ground so the weeds can't grow, intercepts the impact of a pounding rain, and keeps the soil surface uh, very porous and uh, allowing air and water to move in and out. I'm not going to go into greater detail on this, but a real quick side on this work we are doing literally right now, research we are doing now, and this will be coming out this winter, is using male sterile BMR sorghum with enhanced nutrient accumulation. We developed the step to increase the nutrient accumulation. We can equal or exceed corn in energy, which I know is heresy but it works. Uh, the whole idea is as instead of a multi-cut, if you go a one cut, the milk produced just keeps going up almost a straight line. But what we do with the male sterile, delayed harvest, nutrient enhancement, uh, increases the energy and the milk produced tremendously. Basically the plant, instead of photosynthesizing and sending it to seeds, it keeps it all in the stalk, in the plant cells. And so when you look at the energy uh, produced, if we take that sorghum and just replace it with corn silage, Dr. Larry Chase ran the analysis, we didn't get the same milk. But if you rebuilt it, redid the analysis and treated the fact that sorghum is not corn silage, we ended up with the same milk uh, on the sorghum as we did with the corn, same milk here on the sorghum as we did with the corn silage, we actually have more metabolizable protein from sorghum than we did from corn silage. Uh, we were able to do it with almost the same grain and based on a change we made this year, we can do it with less grain than what you use for corn silage. And our yields up at Minor Institute where we are testing varieties 
have equaled or exceeded corn silage. So this is another crop you can add into your rotation cycle. Uh, we have our rotation system here. And if you look at taking these pieces and putting them together, all right, we had our corn that we're doing, but instead we have winter forage that we harvest. We inject the manure because we wanna have the high manure. And then we plant our sorghum afterwards. So we just shifted the workload around by adding a sorghum into the rotation with the corn. You get all those other benefits plus balancing your workload. Another tool of rotation is red clover. Uh, it was an underutilized uh, crop. We have done extensive research on this and have come up with that it's equal or better than alfalfa. In a high forage diet, it has feed value equal or exceeding it. It has a compound that inhibits protein breakdown. So you get more bypass protein. Bypass protein costs like $1,000 a ton. Uh, you can put uh, clover in there and get more bypass protein, meeting your bypass protein needs compared to alfalfa. And then it inhibits rumen, uh, hyper ammonia rumen bacteria that make ammonia used very efficiently, inefficiently in the rumen. Uh, this increases the efficiency of that use. So then we can increase the metabolizable energy for milk. The big key with clover is you got to look at the harvest date. Uh, that's the old farmer's tale as well. We go get our alfalfa first and a couple of weeks later, we get our clover. No, uh, in a warm location, the Columbia County, uh, it was the same day or the day after uh, that the clover was ready compared to the alfalfa. In high cooler elevations of Delaware County, the clover was ready a week before alfalfa. And so if people are out there harvesting clover after alfalfa and they have grass in there, they just did a double whammy on their feed quality. And then in Lewis County, which was up near the lake uh, under the uh, lake effect, uh, it was about uh, a week after that or a few days, uh, five days afterwards that it was ready there. It's not several weeks later. That's what we found for the overall picture. Yield. This is what our yield was for just the first cutting. We were getting three to four tons of dry matter in one cutting using clover the second year after seeding. And uh, um, Julie Hansen at uh, Plant Breeding says that's what she found consistently. The second year of clover always beats the alfalfa in terms of yield. So this is a crop that you can put into your rotation toolbox uh, because of its yield and its feed quality. Uh, the non-fiber carbohydrates equal or exceed alfalfa. And then when we went and ran it through the CNCPS model uh, in the warm location, oh, oops, that backed off here. In the warm location, we were just a little bit under uh, with uh, with protein, but we were a little over with energy. In the high cool elevation, it beat the pants off of alfalfa. Uh, and in the lake effects up by Lewis County, it was equal to alfalfa. Now, one of the last tools I want to cover here is spring oats planted in the August. You plant at the beginning of August, 100 pounds of the acre, you harvest at the end of September. This stuff is really hot forage quality. Uh, crude protein is 17 to 20% if you have enough nitrogen and sulfur. The digestibility is 85 to 90%. It's like green grain. It's phenomenally high uh, with very high sugars and a high digestion rate. So this is another tool you can add into your rotation. Now we've taken this and gone a little bit different we added 100 pounds of uh, grain oats uh, with 80 pounds of triticale. And then as long as we mow it at four inches, then the triticale will regrow. We can get the oats harvested in September, the triticale harvested uh, the next spring. If it turns dry and the oats doesn't grow and you can't harvest 
the oats until well into October, then you're not going to have much, if any, triticale the next spring. But normally it will carry over, especially if you cut it at the right height. It needs to be three and a half to four inch cutting height. Otherwise, if it's shorter, you will not have any triticale the next spring. Okay, let's take these tools and start putting them together. Uh, so we have the whole picture uh, going. Continuous corn, that's what people like to do. That's my good corn field, I'm gonna keep planting corn, corn, corn there. Well, you've got to top dress your daily spread manure there, which means you blow off most of the nitrogen. Uh, the second year, you're gonna to have to add fertilizer nitrogen because you're not gonna have enough manure to meet all the needs unless you're cranking the phosphorus rates way, way high over what they should not be. Yeah, when you get real high phosphorus, you get a lot of phosphorus leaving the field and that contributes to pollution in the water. But if we're daily spreading manure and we got to slather the field to get corn to grow because it's been corn after corn after corn, then that doesn't work. And rootworms build up by the third year and you have to spend more money for a rootworm um, uh, treated or genetic or uh, insecticide system. The shorter rotation you could do is you grow a little shorter season corn and you come in and you plant your triticale afterwards. We inject manure for the triticale. We come back after the triticale is harvested, inject the manure for the corn. And then we repeat that over again. We still need to control for rootworms. But the difference is, is up here, soil health and structure is breaking down over the winter. Erosion is taking soil off the field. Leaching is removing nutrients. But with the tight rotation we have here, using a winter forage as a protectant, it builds soil structure, builds the health over the winter, there's no erosion, nutrients are retained, the soluble phosphorus is retained in the plant, the particulate phosphorus is not removed because of the protection of the soil surface, and we're building organic matter the whole time. You take these two systems and you look at them over the life of the rotation, the average seven year corn has about six tons of dry matter per acre, the corn and triticale has 40% more yield at less cost, erosion control, nutrient retention, we have more yield coming off the farm, but you're protecting the soil the whole time. A variant on this one is to uh, do the same thing, but in this case, we're gonna put sorghum in for one year uh, with the same manure injection, et cetera. And then we don't need rootworms the next year. There, the sorghum wipes out the rootworm. It's actually enhancing the soil structure some too, along with the triticale. So that's how you can just change your rotation a little bit to control pests uh, and to reduce your cost some. The other thing that happens with this is if you happen to get, you know, things go to heck in a handbasket on the farm all the time. You know, we can lay out these best plans and things go wrong. Well, if it gets to be late uh, and you can't get your winter forage planted, uh, on the left side, that is that field that I showed you before where the guy was chopping, uh, this is the deer farm, where he was chopping sorghum off. Here it is, we're going into the winter, we have a foot tall uh, cover crop on the field. It's not as good as on the right because it is in living tissue, but as soon as it gets cold, it'll die, but it'll still protect the soil surface, kill, still keep the soil from washing away. That's the regrowth from the sorghum. Now let's look at it in more typical rotations on the farm. In this case, we're looking at a three years of corn, six years of alfalfa. Well, the first year uh, we get a 15% yield boost because we're using starter nitrogen. Uh, we just need starter nitrogen for the first year corn. Second year corn, we have enough manure, takes care of the nitrogen. We go three years of corn, we have rootworm problems and we have to buy fertilizer nitrogen unless we're gonna overload the field with phosphorus, uh, the manure isn't gonna meet the needs. 
We then come in and we spring seed our alfalfa. We get a half a crop. By the time we get to five and six years, you're looking at equal or less yield than seeding year because the weeds are increasing, the stand is running out. Now, if we just shorten, shorten that whole picture, we're gonna fall kill the sod. That gives us a 17 year, 17% uh, yield boost in addition to the 15 for crop rotation. And all we need is starter nitrogen for the first year. We come back, a little shorter season corn, we plant triticale, inject the manure. We inject the manure after the triticale is harvested for the second corn crop. We then come back with triticale with injected manure to grow that. And then off season, no-till seeding the alfalfa the first week in June, the last week in May. That allows you to do this work on an off cycle system. And then you fall kill the sod after four years and you start back over again. When you're doing that, the top graph is three years of corn, six years of alfalfa. The bottom one is two corn, four alfalfa with triticale. And we look at the yield, we're looking at a 20% yield increase. There's less cost because we're using injected and rotational manure on nitrogen. The erosion is controlled. The fields are not washing away. It's covered all the time. And we're building soil health, soil structure, and soil organic matter. So from our original system, we come in and we fall kill the sod. So half our corn, remember, it's a two-year corn crop. Let me back up here. This is a two-year corn crop. We're going to have one year of corn here, and then the other year of corn comes in over here. So with a two-year corn crop, we fall kill our sod, uh, and then uh, we get our triticale in. We inject manure for the triticale. We inject manure for the second year corn. We take our triticale and inject the manure again, and then no-till our clover. And if we went with uh, clover in this case, instead of alfalfa, we could use alfalfa. But if we go with clover with a three-year rotation, the first year clover has no uh, clover root curculio in there because when the clover root curculio is laying their eggs in uh, April, there's triticale on the field. And the clover root curculio says, we're not gonna bother here, we're gonna look for some clover. So they miss the whole first year of clover that allows us to have a second year of clover with no insect pressure until later into the season. And then we get a full third year clover, come back, rotate that out again, and come back into corn. So looking at this as a cycle, okay, we fall kill our sod and plant our corn real early. That's our earliest corn. We come in after the corn comes off, again, two weeks before wheat planting, uh, and we plant our triticale, come in in November and inject manure for the triticale crop. We harvest that. We come in and we plant our corn, uh, one pass, no-till, but we injected manure before we did that. So we meet all the fertilizer needs. Remember, we're only going two years of corn and there's your two years. We come back and plant triticale and then uh, inject manure to grow the triticale crop and then come back, harvest that plant our seeding, and then with clover, we have two more years of clover and then fall kill the sod. We aren't out there plowing, disking, harrowing, picking stone, and all that other recreational tillage. You can do this with a no-till system very easy. And if we look at this as a system where we went from just a two corn, four alfalfa to the two corn, three clover, you're looking at 21% higher yield coming off of that short clover rotation than we did off of the alfalfa one. And it's much higher than the longer season three corn, six alfalfa system that we had uh, before. Okay, I was gonna stop for questions, but I think I'll keep going and we'll take questions at the end, write them down. Uh, Tom, actually, can you hear me? Yep. So we do have uh, a couple questions, actually. So I think this might be a good time. Is that okay? Okay, go ahead. 
We have three in the chat. So uh, first from Heidi, we have, are there enough custom injection rigs in New York? I'm sorry, hold on. I don't think anybody can hear me. I'm having a conversation with myself over here. <laughs> don't argue with yourself. You might lose that argument. Uh, I have many times. Okay, so are there enough custom injection rigs in New York to meet demand? Or do most farmers who do it buy the equipment? Uh, I can't hear you now. You're, you're, you're echoing so much. I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. I can fix that. So the audience heard me, right? So now the question is, can you hear me now, Tom? Yep, yep, I can hear you. Are there enough custom injection rigs in New York to meet demand, or do most farmers who do it buy the equipment? I have figured out for four or five farms, I have sat down and run the calculations, and with nitrogen now at a dollar a pound, every farm that I did the calculations on, we paid for the rig in one year because you're increasing the nitrogen conservation 75%. Uh, and because nitrogen is now a dollar a pound, we can pay for these rigs real fast. Smaller farms, they can mount them right behind the tanker. That's what we did our first work with. Larger farms are using drag hose. Custom operators are using drag hose. Uh, but even the smaller farms, it's, it's a farm size neutral because you put one of these rigs on, they're not relatively not that expensive. Uh, I think it's 1,500 to 2,000 per unit on the back and not the whole unit, uh, each row type of deal. But uh, you pay for it so fast, you look at it on an environmental basis, it's a huge, huge benefit. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's two more questions. Or maybe, yeah. So next from Josh, how do you, how do you harvest the sorghum mow and chop or corn chopper head with process? Did you hear me there? Uh, uh, just repeat it. Yeah. So how do you how do you harvest the sorghum mow and chop or corn chopper head with processes? Uh, we do not do multi cut. Uh, multi cut gives you half the yield and twice the cost. Uh, we do all single cut. Uh, we come directly in with a Kemper type head. We give it a haircut and it works really well. The biggest problem, it is so easy to chop. The guys drive too fast and leave too big of a stub in the field, which is all digestible component. And we will have a lot more information coming out uh, this year on sorghum, sorghum production and maximizing nutrition from sorghum. Okay, then this is somewhat of a comment, but also a question. Uh, fall killed sod equals no living roots over winter. And so what that is again is he's asked fall kill sod equals no living roots over winter. What was that sod? What? If you're killing the sod, sod in the fall, aren't you also killing the, the roots underneath the ground? Uh, yes, if you mow the sod uh, in the fall, there are a certain amount of roots that are dying. Uh, if you fall kill the sod, yes, the roots are dying over the winter but they die at a slow rate because you're doing it in October. Uh, they did some work where they sprayed it in September and they lost significant amount of nitrogen over the winter because the nitrogen and the organic matter was breaking down too fast before winter. If you do it between the 1st and the 15th of October, uh, the temperatures are dropping, the organic matter breakdown basically stops and it sits over the winter. Uh, the other piece I found out is when I first did this, uh, I could take the whole can of Roundup and set it on an orchard grass plant in the spring, and I couldn't kill it. But it only took a pint of Roundup to kill orchard grass in the fall. Uh, the weeds die a whole lot easier. We have nice bare fields, bare meaning no green material in the spring, which makes it easy for planting. Uh, and then a comment from Paul Ceylon. Uh, so Paul, if this was meant just for me, I apologize, but um, he said here, fall kills sod with dead residue and a wet spring, would soil moisture become an issue? Soil moisture is an issue in a wet spring, no matter what you do. Uh, the worst case is a very well-drained soil with a wet spring. People think they can get out there and they pack the snot out of it, which was my talk this morning. Uh, what we found, that there is better drainage on those fields. 
because all that mass of root system that was there that we killed off, the organic matter is still in the hole, but the hole has a lot more airspace and the field actually drains better fall killing that sod than if we left it and spring killed it and then had tight, uh, still live roots there packing everything together. It really loosens the soil up and the top two or three inches are literally like potting soil. Great. Okay, that's it for questions for now. Unless, is there any in the audience up until this point? You'll get a chance. Okay, so far so good in the crowd. So go ahead and continue, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so a thing I ran into early on when I got into doing this is guys say, yeah, I rotate. I use such and such a rotation. I use a three corn uh, five hay rotation. I work 480 acres. I seed about 30 acres down each year because that's the rotation we're using is um, a three corn, five hay. Well, 480 acres divided by the 30 acres you're seeding down, you have a 16 year rotation, not an eight year rotation. It is twice as long as what you think. What you have is a, oops, what you have is a sequential monoculture. You need to write it down. And the only rotation that works is one that is written. You got to plan ahead to get ahead. And you can make weather adjustments, but you need to have every field writ write it, write, written down. And a rule we use is soils drives a rotation, which drives what the cows are fed. And each field may have a different rotation, but that's the best rotation for that field. And if you put it on a spreadsheet, write it out, you can total up how many acres of each crop you have. Uh, it's not hard to do. I had a program way back in uh, the late 80s, a spreadsheet program that did exactly that. We put in the rotations and it tell us what our base is and then what we have to have each year. Uh, so if we're rotating and we have 980 acres uh, that we're cropping, well, we got 15 acres of continuous grass. So we're gonna pull that out. That's not gonna be in there. That means we have 893 acres rotated. If we're using that rotation we set um, and dividing that if we're going four corn, uh, two corn, four hay, uh, that's six years for the cycle. That means 149 acres are seeded down, uh, 298 acres are of corn and 446 acres are of hay. The soils drives a rotation which drives what the cows are fed. I asked Dr. Larry Chase one time, I said, how much corn and hay should we be feeding cows? His answer was, I don't care. Make me quality forage. And it doesn't matter whether it's all haylage or, or corn silage. Uh, if it's quality forage, we can make the milk off of it. So it comes back to, again, what is your soils? What is the best rotation for your soils? That's what you should be doing. And this is a piece that a lot of farms uh, did not realize or did not follow through on. If we're doing two corn winter forage seeding down uh, with three alfalfa, if we have 331 acres and it's a six year rotation, well, that's about 52 acres of corn. One, 52 acres of corn, two. Remember this corn has no nitrogen needed. This is where we inject the manure. Uh, winter covers, we're going to have 52 acres. We're only putting it on after corn too. Uh, so uh, we have 52 acres of winter forage. In this case, we're only putting it on. You may want to put it on above. And then we have 52 acres of alfalfa two, 52 acres of alfalfa three, 52 acres of alfalfa four, which gets sprayed out in the fall to bring our first year corn around. So what you have is 104 acres of corn, 52 acres of new seeding and 156 acres of hay. You need to take the farm and figure it out. And for some of these big farms, it takes a while to figure it, but it is the best thing they can do to really implement a rotation on their farm. Here's that same farm with the 52 that I had. And then we put down to all the different fields, uh, what was on them. Uh, we were shooting, oh, let me back up here, sorry. We were shooting for 52 acres on here. Well, this one is gonna be a little higher on the corn because there's a few bigger fields in here. 
Some of these will be a little bit shorter. It'll vary around that number. It won't be exactly, but you can get it really close so you're following the rotation. And the rotation, reason for the rotation is it's not the strongest that survives or the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. And using rotations allows you to respond to change. I had a farmer that went to this whole two corn, four hay rotation, uh, and he followed it religiously. And we had good years, we had crappy years. And in the crappy years, everybody's saying, oh, we're not going to have enough feed. It's, this is a problem. The crop isn't growing well. And he said, I still have good crops. I rotated. My sod fields are coming through this lousy weather really good. The second year corn was only, well, uh, two years of corn. So it's still in really good shape. And we're back at the seedings. He says, I am doing really well, simply because I had a rotation and I followed it. Now, finally, I do have a newsletter that I send out. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, just drop me an email. Uh, probably a large number of you get it already. Um, so uh, if you want to get that, just drop me an email uh, and we'll be glad uh, uh, to do that. Questions? Okay, Tom, so uh, no more questions yet in the chat. So if you're in the chat, go ahead and uh, feel free to ask. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, we got one in the back there. You're going to have to speak up. Have them tell you and you tell me. Exactly. Go ahead. Uh, what's the, uh, I'm sorry, the triticale oat mix in pounds? Do you have that? Did you 80, that? Yeah, 80 pounds of uh, a triticale, 100 pounds of grain oats. You don't need a forage oats, a grain oats. If you're not going to put triticale under it, and you may end up picking that oats later, then you could use a forage oats, but otherwise a grain oats is fine. Okay, and Tom, can you uh, back up one slide? Um, we had someone request that. Okay, well, I think it was the crop news. Oh, the crop soil news? Yeah, Liz, uh, clarify which slide you meant. Anybody else from the audience? The new one, the news, that's fine. Okay, oh, there's Liz. Thank okay, you. Okay, no, yep, you're welcome. Anybody else? I assume that was Liz and not the, the voice of God there, so. <laughs> it could have been the voice of God, you never know. Uh, it could be both, it could be both. Um, it was Liz. <laughs> all right, Tom, I think uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. So again, Tom, I bet would, would be happy to hear from any of you if you wanted to reach out to him and if you had more questions. Uh, you saw his contact information. And he also does have some videos on his website um, with some presentations that would, might have some more insight into what he talked about today. So please check be, that out. I'll be putting more of those up. Uh, one of my jobs this winter is to load more of my uh, short presentations onto the website. They're anywhere between three to eight minutes long. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tom.